Hey, good day everybody. So today I thought let's have a look at the Celestron 925 after I've been using it for a year. Predominantly really just for astrophotography, although I would like to do some visual with it. Um, like I said, it's been about, it's been a bit over a year now and I've taken a few different pictures, galaxies, bit of, bit of a nebula, close-up sort of nebula shots and um, some planetary work as well, Saturn and Jupiter. So I thought we could have a little bit of a look at the scope and what I think about it. I've written down a few points that I'd like to go over. Um, might be a little bit of a long video, but I think, you know, there's quite a, you know, there's quite a lot to discuss about this scope and there's a lot that I do like about this scope now. Um, and I can see why it was so popular when I was researching it. So let's get into it. Like I said, it might be a bit long, but try and stick with me. So Celestron nine and a quarter inch it is a weird size. <laughs> um, um, yeah, you see that around a bit, you know, like often you see eight inches and 10 inches, but you know, a nine and a quarter is uh, quite a unique size, but I was basically, I came across this because I was looking for a scope that I could use for planetary work, um, galaxies, that type of thing down here in the Southern Hemisphere. Before this, I only really had a Newtonian. Um, I did, I have got also a uh, Esprit um, reflector, uh, refractor, sorry, which is still only 840 millimeters. So I really wanted something like this, which is natively runs at 2,350 millimeters. And like I said, I did the research and what the, I guess the main points that drew me to this were that it was getting a lot of good reviews. I didn't see much negative feedback on it and the portability of it. Now I know it's not a light scope. This is a nine kilogram scope. However, um, it's only three kilos more than the eight inch version. And I thought for myself, that at least is gonna be manageable to lift onto the mount. And even though I've got all the astro gear on it at the moment, it is at least for me manageable to get onto a mount. Whereas, you know, there's no way I could go for the 11 inch version or even like a 10 inch mead. They're just too heavy. I think you're getting up to, you know, uh, 12 and a half kilos for the 11 inch and about even more, I think, for the 10 inch mead. So um, that made it ideal for me because I do have to put this on and off of my uh, SEM60 mount each night when I do use it. Now I've got it on this mount at the moment, but this is just really for display purposes. I wouldn't normally put it on this kind of mount. It's just not, it's not really heavy enough for this kind of scope. So we'll get into that, but let's first just go over the specs of the scope. So natively this runs at F10 and it's 2,350 2, millimeters. Like I said, it's nine kilogram, the actual um, scope itself. Um, in terms of what you get with the scope, obviously you get a cover for the end, a plastic cover. Um, you do get this bottom rail, of course. The top rail you don't get. I've added this top rail here. Um, you do get a little one and a quarter back, um, you know, for the, for the eyepiece. It's not particularly good, so you're going to want to, you know, if you're going to be using this for visual, you're really going to want to change, you know, change that at the back there. And finally, over here, you do actually get a 25 millimeter plossel as well. So at least you get, you know, one eyepiece just to, just to start you off a nice, a nice um, size eyepiece, 25 millimeter, which actually I need to use a lot more. I need to do a little bit more visual with this. I've kind of been doing a lot of astrophotography, but I would like to do a bit more visual and um, that'll probably be my plan for next year to actually try a bit of visual astronomy as well. Cause I think sometimes I miss out with this scope doing so much astrophotography and I'd like to just get it out and use my eyes and have a look at those stars and planets a bit. So that's the basic specs of it. Um, now because of this being a nine and a quarter the primary mirror on this as well runs at um, f 2.3 so I've heard. So I think that is another thing that adds to this scope keeping its collimation. That's what I've heard anyway so you know let me know if I'm wrong on that but I bought this second hand. Um, it was nearly new, the guy that sold it to me, nice guy, I bought it second hand. And even after it was shipped to me, I checked its collimation and it was nearly pretty much spot on when I got it. I've had it over a year and I did check it about two weeks ago. And it is fractionally now, like I checked it on a defocus start, it's fractionally out, slightly out of collimation, but it wasn't enough 
to be worth bothering with that night so I've I've left it so it seems to hold its collimation really well this scope um, now like I said the other main thing that attracted me to this is because it is that nine kilogram and it fits nicely you know it's like I said it's, it's not as light as obviously an eight inch scope but it's also usable for me to actually take out every night myself um, you know if, once you get up to sort of those sort of scopes which are like the 11 inch or you're getting sort of 12 13 14 kilos they're really only any good for they're really more suited to when you've got an actual observatory or you don't need to be moving it every night now this is still quite heavy i admit especially when it's loaded with all my gear here on the back but it's manageable for me and that's what i like about it i can still actually you know lift this in and out and it's not really much heavier than my Esprit 120 probably both come in in a similar weight you know with by the time it's loaded up it's probably about 12 kilos something along those lines so very manageable in terms of its weight now in terms of amount for this scope I guess it depends to some extent whether you're doing visual or whether you're doing astrophotography this HEQ5 Pro which is probably equivalent to the Celestron AVX has a payload capacity of about 14 kilos so for astrophotography this is not suitable because this is really going to be loaded up nearly to its maximum limit so it just wouldn't be worth it for that you could at a push i think use it for planetary if you just had a little planetary camera and um, you know all you were using is a little light uh, planetary camera on the back so you weren't really adding a lot of weight you could probably get away with a bit of planetary photography on this because you're just taking those those video files rather than the long exposures um, now ideally you really want this scope at least on something like an EQ6 um, something like an EQ6 or a uh, an AZ what's the other one called the AZ EQ6 something that's got a 20 about a 20 kilo capacity I think Celestron do the C C gem mount which I think as well has got about 20 kilos but I'd say that's really what you want if you're going to be doing any astrophotography with this like as a minimum I've now got it on a SEM60 and before that I did have it on an AZ GT EQ6 I always forget the name of that mount which had a 20 kilo capacity and although it managed it I found I lost a lot of exposures uh, you know so it wasn't really beefy enough for it so I'd advise going for something that's got about more like a 30 kg capacity for a scope like this but you know that's up to you but that's just my preference on it um, now if you're using it for astrophotography and even if you're using it for visual you are definitely going to want a dew shield for this um, I've got this one here which is from I think they're called W and W Astro this was very reasonably priced now this is a heated dew shield again because I'm using it for astrophotography I need this to stay I need this to be heated so it keeps this primary mirror clear for the whole night um, yeah or the corrector plate yeah clear for the whole night um, if you're using it for just visual you could probably just get away I've seen people just make their own dew shield if it's just for like an hour or two but if you're using an Astro you're probably going to need some sort of a heated dew shield like this or I think Celestron these days even do a ring that you can fit to the front as well um, and of course that means you're going to need a dew heater as well to power that so that's one thing to that's one thing to bear in mind because um, yeah it's gonna it's gonna fog up pretty quickly this when it's left out it won't take won't take very long at all on a cold especially on a cold night so let's get into um, let's have a look now so like I said collimation still not been touched now astrophotography specifically is what I've been using it for um, and I must say in general I've been really impressed like I said collimation's not been an issue for me so that's been a breeze a lot easier than I expected I thought at least I'd have to have um, you know sort of changed the collimation by now because I thought it would have gone out but I've not had to do any corrections to it um, in terms of if you want to use this for wide field astrophotography um, you know you're probably going to want to invest in a reducer of some sort now the Celestron reducer I did have that to begin with it's not it's okay but it's not great so they're pretty cheap and they're not bad if you want to just get started but I since went to the Star Arizona Star Arizona reducer here now a lot more expensive but 
it works really well. Um, and so long as you set it up right and you get your backspacing bang on, you'll get really good stars out to the edge of the field and a nice sharp image. So for astrophotography, I can't recommend that Starry Zona reducer highly enough. I did also put on a Barda two inch click lock because I wanted to make sure that everything was held really secure. Um, Cause it is, you know, it is all just a pushing fitting here. So I wanted to make sure I had something that was gonna keep everything nice and centered. Those Barda click locks, they're not again, super cheap, but gives me a lot of reassurance that nothing's gonna fall out <laughs> at the end of my scope, um, which you don't want, eh? especially when you've got all that gear on it. Um, in terms of cameras, I've had, you know, I've had a couple of cameras on this. The 533 goes really nicely with it. Um, the ASI 2600 mm also goes really nice. So I've had good pictures out of both of those, even the APS-C size sensor. Um, because our weather's not been great at the moment, I have been going more with the 533. I've just changed back onto that. Um, and yeah, like I say, that's an ideal sensor. And especially with that reducer, perfect stars right out you know to the whole field of view i've attached an eaf so um zwo do make a bracket specifically for these um these celestron schmidt cassegrains that's worked fine it's a little bit fiddly to fit really you've got to i mean you've got to take off the obviously the little um wheel at the back for your focus and and um, attach this whole fitting in the eaf but once it's done i've not had any issues with that um, whatsoever. Um, galaxies, it's ideal. Like, so with the reducer on, you're getting it down to 1550 millimeters. So you still great for like some galaxies. Um, I'm currently actually taking the Tarantula Nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud with this again. Um, I'm taking some long sort of five minute exposures with a duo narrow band filter on this one shot color camera. And again, if you wanna get close in on those deep sky objects, sometimes it's nice to get that really tight field of view. Um, whether it's Carina, you know, the Keyhole Nebula in Carina, or like I said, the Tarantula. Galaxies, again, it's ideal for. And then of course, you know, take this off and the reducer and you stick a Barlow on it and it's ideal for planetary. Like, so I've got some really nice pictures of Saturn out there, some really nice pictures of Jupiter. With a three times Barlow, with a two times Barlow, you can get some really, really cool images. So, you know, it's such a versatile scope. I mean, and if you really want to, obviously at the end here, you got the fast star compatible. So if you really want to, you've got the Star Arizona Hyperstar. I mean, they're not cheap, but that's gonna bring you down to like, I don't know, whatever it is, F2 point something. So you can almost use this like a Raza if you want to. I'm choosing not really to do that because I've heard they can be, they can be a bit tricky. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm not going down that route, but that's certainly an option if you want to do it. And I've seen people use these like in all three configurations. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot that you can do with this scope and it's really versatile. For me personally, the way I use it and the way that I found worked really well for me is I attached a top rail here. So I bought a separate rail, attached that to the top this is a Farpoint Astro handle here. These things are great. So you can just mount this onto this uh, plate here at the top. And this handle, just, you know, just like a Losmandy D plate. Um, you can see there, look how it comes off. And then you can attach it to, you know, to your other scopes as well, if you've got other heavier scopes. Um, I use this on the Esprit as well. But this thing's a godsend and I highly recommend it for a scope that weighs a fair bit like this, especially like me if you're lifting it on. If you're lifting it on and off and every night, it really is, for me, it's become essential actually. So let me just stick that back on. The other thing, I mean, this is just personal to me, but my particular setup is I just have a, I have this juice. Do um, controller attached to the top again. I've just got a little Losmandy D plate, and so I just connect this up like this. That sits on the top, and then this actually plugs down to a power point that's on the side of my mount on my SEM60. This works really well because it's also got two power outputs here. So then I actually do the power. I actually take the power here, and I just push it up through to the um, the Duke controller in that powers my camera. So 
you know, like I said, just one way of setting it up. There's obviously many. And then all I do here is I just attach my USB cable here at the back to my camera. Um, that's really all I need to do. Hey guys, so just quickly to concentrate on this area, one thing that I've not covered is just the OAG. So I've got an off-axis guider on this, which is you know obviously used for guiding. And at this kind of focal length, 1525, um, you know, you're really gonna, it's really gonna benefit you from getting an off-axis guider because obviously you're gonna be guiding at the same focal length as your primary camera. So your guiding is gonna be, you know, your guiding is gonna be a lot better. Uh, you probably can get away. I don't know if you had a particularly large guide scope. You probably could get away with using one um, for a, t a period of time. But yeah, I think an OAG in this case is, is um, I found it really uh, a really good investment and really necessary. This is the Celestron OAG, which, um, you know, I think it's quite good because it's got a big prism inside and it's also got lots of different adapters for connecting up to your cameras and things. You've got a helical focuser on the top here and I'm using the ASI 174mm Mini, which with its um, uh, big pixels is an ideal, it's an ideal match as well for this sort of um, size scope and focal length. So just one thing to bear in mind there in terms of your guiding, your astrophotography guiding. You know, I may move in the future to putting a mini PC up here as well. That's something I'm considering at the moment just to get, you know, make my cabling even cleaner. But you know, that's all personal stuff. So. I hope that's, um, hope that's been a bit useful if there's anybody out there considering one of these. Um, like I said, I can't really recommend these highly enough. Um, just been, it's one of those scopes that's been hard to complain about and it's definitely become, um, it's definitely become one of my, one of my favorites now. So um, I think with that, I might just leave you with a couple of pictures that I've taken with this and um, clear skies to everybody out there. And I'll, I'll catch you next time, everyone. Thank you.